In my last video, we talked about how to calculate and display the top float path for any activity in your P6 schedule as an alternative to just viewing the longest path of the project. Today, we're going to dive a little deeper and see how we can use float paths to quickly and easily view all of the near critical paths of the overall project or any specific activity we'd like. We're going to start the same way as last time. Let's open up the schedule window, go to options, and into the advanced tab. Now, we want to click on Calculate Multiple Float Paths, and be sure that Free Float is selected and not Total Float. Next, we're going to pick the activity that we want to view the float paths for. For now, let's just go with Contractor Field Completion. This is going to show us the overall completion for the project. But, as I showed you in the previous video, you can use any milestone or activity in the schedule as your endpoint. Now, before we close this window and schedule things, make sure you look at this field at the bottom. Specify the number of paths to calculate. Right now, mine is set to 10, which I find usually suits my needs. If you want to dive deeper into your near critical paths, you can always increase this number to see more. Uh, you really aren't going to see any benefit from using a lower number in pretty much any case. So now let's close this and hit schedule. That was quick. Now the float paths are calculated, and first I'm going to show you the layout that I typically use to view them, and then I'll go through and show you exactly how to put that layout together. Let's open a layout. Here's my float path report. Let's go over to see things here on the Gantt side. So this is how I have to have things grouped. At the top, we have float path one, which is your longest path to the selected activity. In this case, this is pretty much what we expect to see from the critical path or longest path of the project. Let's look down at float path two. As you can see in this case, it's just one activity. That's because we're not duplicating any activities that are on previous float paths. So basically anything else that would be on float path two is already on float path one. So we're just seeing things that are different. This is a, a side branch, if you will. If we click on the activity, you can take a look and you can see where it branches off. In this case, predecessor driving this one is install permanent signage you know, up here. So float path one goes up through install permanent signage. Then we get this offshoot on a substantial completion. Then it comes back to punchless generation. Really it's just skipping one milestone of you know, a side concurrent branch. You can see where it branches off, where it ties back in. And if you scroll down a little, you can see the other critical paths, near critical paths, you know, path three, path four, and some of these are longer paths like this. And then in some cases you're just going to see you know smaller offshoots where you know Everything else is already on a previous critical path. It's just a, a small, tiny offshoot. And you can also see, let's look at this one in more detail, for example. See, it starts on the data date and easy enough to track how this flows through. And then when you get down to this activity, striping and reflectors, it's showing as completing on August 23rd its successor, install permanent signage, is starting on August 25th. And that's where it ties back into the main critical path. You know, so we've got about a day of float there on this float path. Now let me show you how we put this layout together. Let's go back to uh, our more standard WBS view. Get sort of a, a blank starting point canvas. So you're starting with this overall schedule view. Let's open up our group and sort menu. Right now we're grouping by WBS, but let's change this to group by float path. And hit OK. Now you can see this has all your float path groupings up to the number that we calculated, you know, 1 through 10, just like I was showing you in, in my previous report. But activities that are remaining in the schedule that aren't on any of these 10 float paths are going to be grouped at the bottom, listed under no float path. This one that I have open here is in a large schedule. 
but you can see every other remaining activity in the schedule is down here under no flow path. So I usually like to clean this report up by getting rid of that bottom section with a filter. So if we open up our filter menu, I'll show you how to create a new one. Call this float paths one through 10 and create a filter where float path is less than or equals 10. Do that. Make sure we clear and set that as our only active filter. Apply and hit OK. And now you can see we're just seeing those 10 float paths. It's getting rid of that section at the bottom. Also, that's a good way to shorten things up if you know you just want to see a, a smaller number in here, for example, I'll quickly go through this. I just change that to five. And now, filter, we're only showing the top five. And obviously, once you're in here, you can modify your columns, get whatever you want to see displayed, you know, adjust it as you see fit. Now, if you're going to want to see more float paths than 10, you know, which, which I'm keeping it to here, one thing to remember is don't just change the filter. You also have to make sure to calculate the number of float paths. You know, sometimes if you're in a bigger schedule, you, you think you're going to want to see more float paths rather than just set that calculation to 10 like I did, maybe set it to a number significantly higher, set it to 100. You know, that way it's calculating those and then you can keep it using a filter just to the number that you actually want to look at. So, I hope this video gave you some insight on using float path calculations to view the near critical paths of your milestone or any activities of your choosing. Please visit the PMA Consultants website for more tips and clips on best scheduling practices. Thanks.